Thank you, Lauren. Uh, Sammy, do you want to comment on the data issue? Yes, yes, I would like to, to comment on that. Um, when, when it comes to the availability of the data, first and for, for, foremost, we need to have the capacity of that institute which produces reliable, you know, timely on data on timely fashion in the first place. Then the data is there. Somebody has to do the analysis. That's what we are missing. That's what is missing now in, 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 many, in many African cases, I think. The data are there. Here and there, sex disaggregated data are there, but nobody is taking them and analyzing so that we can have something to say. That's, the, the, I think, the, uh, the problem. But in the first place, we need to have a good, good institution to produce quality, reliable data. Now, you can see this, this uh, pamphlet that uh, Dr. Adeka was uh, distributing. It's, it uses the, our, our data, CSS data. So they came up with a good analysis with recommendation, everything. So we need to have this kind of data which is available so that the researchers take it and then analyze it. The same with gen gender data. So my, my point is strengthening the statistical institutions is a very important so that we can have, in the first place, we, we need to have that reliable data. Thank you. Thank you, Samia. Uh, Suresh, could you talk about, I think you mentioned already uh, what kind of capacity for who? but it came up again, so if you come briefly, just to... Yeah, that's a, that's a, a point. The point I was making is that, that um, in, in strengthening the resilience of the food systems, you need to look at various types of institutions that are uh, part of the system. And what kind of capacity is needed, where it is needed, depends on uh, looking at the institutions uh, individually. And some institutions are well-developed in capacity, some are not, even in the same country. So you need to have a capacity needs assessment before you invest so that we can you know, invest the scarce resources in building capacity effectively so that we can target the funding to specific needs and fill the gaps so that, that, that uh, we can uh, have holistic capacity at the in institutional level, not only at the individual level, but also institutional. That, that includes this managerial and administrative capacity that was mentioned, that leadership capacity that's missing sometimes. Um, to hold on and effectively use the capacity that we have into uh, um, uh, addressing our goals that we set for ourselves. Um, but very important, take an extreme example of resilience in Japan, for example. Uh, there are not uh, many NGOs running around in Japan helping Japanese government uh, trying to build back their system, right? Why? Capacity. And what level? And someone said, I mean, the development seriously done is capacity building. We should not be here doing this business in the next 20 years. We should be out of business. Then we have achieved our goal. That should be our goal. <laughs> I'm <laughs> provocating, but, but that's, that's what I've been doing. So it's very important. You can do all you want, but if you don't strengthen our people, national systems, and my colleague said, Africa for Africa, and someone said, you don't pay taxes. I didn't understand that, but <laughs> what, what, what is this? Building local capacity is fundamental for people to solve their own problems. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, Sean on the Co curriculum. curriculum and <clears throat> yeah, no, thanks very much. Um, so um, when I'm talking about the core curriculum, um, let me just talk about it in terms of how we work with farmer organizations. Um, one of the reasons for developing this was uh, we did a study about, I don't know, four or five years ago, uh, looking at what were the current models that people, you know, from extension, from the NGOs doing, using to work with farmer groups. Uh, so one of the things that came back quite... Um, uh, frequently to us was farmer field schools. Uh, other ones were self-help groups. Um, they were sort of cooperative processes. And what we were trying to look for at that time was, you know, what is the best practice in this area? So we did a study in Latin America, in Africa, and Asia, and we were asking lots of farmer organizations, what kind of skill sets do you have and what skills are you looking for? 
and there was a, a pretty consistent um, alignment across all of those areas that there were five things that people were really looking for. So there's sort of these five. A better understanding of group organization and how people actually organize themselves within a, within a group and a, and a process for doing that. Uh, people wanted to have a much better understanding about uh, finances, you know, whether that's financial education or savings and loans, but that local capacity to, to learn financial skills. Uh, there was a lot of demand for learning more about marketing, and I think traditional extension systems really have not uh, engaged in that area, so that's a real gap that people were looking for. Um, the other one was, you know, obviously looking about, you know, how to utilize your local NRM as, as effectively as possible. And the final thing was innovation. And I think, you know, uh, innovation is very much around this idea of what are the things that challenge us most? And resilience is really looking at that, you know, this whole idea of having a much better assessment of your risks and being able to sort of build in place either capacities or technologies or whatever it is that faces the next problem that you're going to have, whether it's a recurrent drought or a recurrent flood or cyclones, whatever those things are, you're using that core set of skills to be able to, uh, you know, build your social capital within your group, learn so that you can learn how to save, so that you've got some money to invest, uh, produce crops or livestock more effectively, be able to sell that, and then be able to innovate. And so those ideas have formed the basis of our core curriculum, and they are used in different ways in different locations. But having that ability to have a consistent approach to the core training allows us to have a much better idea of what are we, you know, what type of engagement are we having with partners, and we can use a sort of a mix of how we use those trainings to deal with different segments of farmers or clients within a farming community. And I think along with many NGOs, what we're finding is that it's actually better to start with something like a savings and loans approach rather than diving straight into value chains. Particularly if you're going to be working with vulnerable groups, women's groups, uh, farmers that are working in vulnerable areas, if first of all we can get those groups of people just to come together, to trust each other, to start learning about finances, when it comes to value chain development, it's a much easier process. But in doing that, we kind of slow down development a little bit, or the process of engagement, because we spend the first sort of, I don't know, let's say year, 18 months, working on building the social capital before we go into the productive uh, approach. So, you know, that's where we really need help with investors to allow us to have the time to work with communities to get those things right before we start to sort of optimize situations. So that's the, the basic sort of idea. Thank you very much. Uh, Cornell, you want to comment on the management of an institution? Just briefly. Yeah, just I mean, you're saying um, about administration and management. I think one of the learning we had from our child survival problem in Bangladesh was really interesting. I mean, it was a problem focused on child survival, so we're looking at clinical outcomes or you know, outcomes in terms of mortality and morbidity. But actually, the intervention focused almost entirely on management of the health systems. Actually, not on clinical work at all, but very much on administration and management. And it was around creating a basically effective, efficient, accountable management. And part of it was about accountability, so that you had you know, uh, civil society groups or groups of, of um, poor people themselves, like a ward health committee, holding the local health service to account. But, um, but I think that was interesting that it actually the focus of it and what made it effective was actually the focus on general management. I think that links a little bit in with our colleague's um, question here around you know, local grown or, or, or African expertise. I think, I mean, I've always said that my job and concern is to try and get concern out of the middle of projects. It's a bit of a struggle. But you know, that's one of the tasks is actually how do you get us out and out on the edge so that local institutions are very much at the center of projects. That's very context dependent. I mean, we, we, we manage that in areas where there are very strong local civil society. In places like Eastern Chad, for example, where you know, there's, there's a certain level of social capital but not strong institutions, we find ourselves getting sucked in. And I think the only way to solve it, it takes time, but it's the synergies of building capacity of a variety of different institutions at the same time so that they will mutually reinforce themselves. And again, if you go back to, say, India, if you look at the work of local NGOs in India, they, have, they stay in the same places for very long periods of time. They, they empower, they set up institutions with the poor, but they're always there to support them. They're, they're in the background, but it's that dynamism of the different strong institutions that actually 
get that local dimension and local institutions at the center of things. I think that's what we need to be doing. Thank you. I think we can take one round of uh, quick questions, and I know a gentleman here has been quite you, weren't you? Thank you. My question is to Samia. Enabling the environment for community institution is something that's very important and critical, which has social, environmental, technical, cultural, you know, a dynamic issue which is not going to be easy for all the, the, the same, to go for the same, I mean, attitude for all the areas. What do you think that the things that shouldn't be missed when we are approaching this? Okay. Yes, one here. Thanks. Uh, Sarah Delaney, I work with Episcopal Relief and Development, and we also work uh, with local partners like um, I know Concern and CRS do. And one challenge I've noticed in building capacity of um, implementing institutions is the time trade-off between them wanting to focus on the field work and getting things done, and they have a lot to do during the year, and, and then wanting to do skills building and learning. Um, so I didn't know if anyone on the panel had suggestions or things they've noticed that have worked to help small implementing organizations um, want to prioritize taking time out to learn and realizing that it's going to make them a more effective um, institution in, in the long run. Thank you. 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 Thank you.